Literally, all the elders drew back and, and trembled. They said, please, tell us the bad news. Just get it over with what's happening. And he says, I'm coming to Jesse's house. They said, Jesse, how do you know Jesse? He goes, I don't. The Holy Spirit told me to go to his house. He says, Jesse, my name's Samuel. And he goes, yes, Prophet Samuel, I know who you are. He goes, I would like to have a dinner with your family. Yes, anything you want. Quick, quick, get things ready. He says, I'm going to pray for one of your sons. Bring all of your sons to the dinner. Yes. So the verse 10, Jesse made the seven sons pass before Samuel, the prophet. And the prophet said, I looked at all seven. There's, the spirit says none of them. I don't know how this is possible because I'm positive I heard from God. But the Holy Spirit said he's not chosen any of them. Verse 11, Samuel said, are all your sons here? Is there one that isn't here just by chance? Then the father said, well, yes, there is the youngest. And, there, and I underline the word, there he is. Meaning, David was within sight. They said right there in the backyard. Now, here's the point I want you to get. The most powerful prophet in the earth visits this town and wants dinner with the family, and David is tending the sheep. He's mowing the lawn during that two-hour period because his dad made him. David's going, oh, dad, please. He goes, no. They could have easily got a neighbor to take care of the sheep. It was not a big deal. And they said, there he is, meaning he's right in the backyard. He's keeping the sheep. He's doing a very mundane task. Samuel said, the prophet Samuel said to David's father, Jesse, we are not going to sit down till that kid is at the table. So all the big brothers are standing up. And they're running out quick to get Davy. Davy, Davy, quick. Samuel, the prophet, he knows you somehow. The spirit is talking. David's going, oh, no, what's going on? David comes running. You can see him just panning. What's going on? And the brothers are looking at him. Verse 13. Samuel took the horn of oil and he anointed him. He said, this is the future king of Israel. This little 16, 17 year old, he is the man God's eyes has fallen on. He's the one that God sees loyalty in his heart. You have written him off, but God has included him in his purposes. Paragraph E. David had to overcome rejection by his family. But the remarkable thing about David that I want you to get because I could take a while and, and describe the rejection, but I'm not going to for, for very long, just to point it out. Because <clears throat> I want to get on with the story so you get the feel of the overall story. But the, a miracle of David's life was he was rejected, but he had no bitterness. He was rejected, but he didn't have a rejection spirit at all. How can a guy be rejected by his family but not have a rejection spirit because he was preoccupied with God? Rejection still hurts when you're preoccupied with God, but a rejection from people does not become a rejection spirit. A rejection spirit is when it gets into your mindset to where you think about it through almost every relationship. They like me. They don't like me. They're thinking about me. They're not thinking about me. They forgot me. It's all that they got a conspiracy. I know what they really meant. And almost always through a rejection spirit, the information that is processed is wrong. But the miracle of David, he's rejected, but he has no rejection spirit because he's preoccupied with God and he's faithful in servitude and humility. It's a remarkable combination. Look what he said in Psalm 27.10. <clears throat> he said, my father and my mother forsake, forsake me, but the Lord will take care of me. He said, my mom and dad 
will forsake me. Now, this isn't written by a, a mature man. A 40-year-old man doesn't pine away and say, my mom and dad haven't called me, it's over. No, this is a young boy that's saying this. How did he know God would take care of him? Somewhere in his walk with God, he connected that though his parents forsook him, God did not. That is a miracle for a young teenager to connect with that reality. But that was because David was preoccupied with knowing God, not preoccupied with everybody hearing the story of how mistreated he was in his family. It says in Psalm 38, 11, My loved ones, my friends, they stand aloof. My relatives, they stand even further back. He goes, my friends and my family, they won't come near me. Beloved, there's a lot of emotion behind that one sentence. There's a number of you in this room. You have been rejected by your friends and your families, but you don't have to be a victim with a rejection spirit. You're, there's another option. You can get preoccupied with God. You can go somewhere with God because though the others have failed to look at you, God's eyes are on you if you want to go there with Him. Psalm 69, verse 7. David's still talking about his family. Now this is because of his zeal for God. He said, for your sake, God, he's talking direct to God. I've borne reproach. Repro reproach means they're criticizing me. They're putting me down because of you. Shame has covered me because of you, God. I am a stranger to my brothers. In other words, David's seven brothers go, kid, we don't get you. You're, you play that guitar late at night under the stars and sing those songs you're strange. You're not like other young boys. He said, my, I'm a stranger to my seven older brothers, meaning they don't get me at all. Nobody understands me. And he goes on to describe why. Verse 9, because zeal for you, God, has eaten me up. I am so consumed with you, and nobody else gets it in my immediate world, but I don't care. I'm going for you. They wag their head at me. Verse 10. I wept and I chastened my soul with fasting. He goes, I would weep in prayer and in worship and I would fast and I would seek God and my friends. That was a reproach. They wag their head at me and they criticize me. This is David's experience. You know, we read about David and we think, well, I'm going to be like David. But do you really know the David story? Well, wasn't he the guy that was king? Well, eventually, he was a guy that was profoundly rejected in his youth by men, and he took that pain and that energy and became consumed and obsessed and preoccupied with God. And God's eyes fell on this young man. Now, let's go down to paragraph G. One of the lessons in the Bethlehem, and this is the one we spent the most time on. We'll be briefer on the other uh, four cities. In the Bethlehem years, what God wants you to have is the intimacy focus. He, it's okay to succeed in other areas, for sure. But He doesn't want the other areas to be the primary dream of our heart. Most 15-year-olds, they're far more concerned with how pe what people think of them, what they look like, what they're achieving, who they're over, who's talking to them, and that's normal. We're all like that, but there's another thing happening in the hearts of some 15-year-olds in the earth. They are connecting with God. They go, you know, I, I still care about that stuff, but it's not my biggest dream. I'm, I'm listening to the music from heaven, and that's where my heart lives. There's another sound that's touched me, not just the sound of my high school or the sound of my campus or my friends. There's another sound that's got a hold of my heart.